If you were to flip through the brittle and yellowed pages of your grade school pocket dictionary, the French word panache would jump out at you, almost immediately. That's because the academic community couldn't come up with a definition more precise than a glossy 8x10 of a cheetah. Anyone who was anyone had one of these prolific sports cars. Wherever it went, it left a trail of celebrity DUIs spanning from Ocean Drive to Vespucci Boulevard. And can you blame them? The cheetah goes together with narcotic-fueled public breakdowns like porta potties and food truck cuisine. An ungodly mess for everyone involved. The grotty of the 80s really knew how to make a status car. In its heyday, the prancing rabbit had only the winged horseshoe to worry about. Instead of recycling the same two models indefinitely, they actually had to fight for their fair share of artists, drug lords, athletes, and VCPD officers. The cheetah won over the hearts and the envy of the masses quite easily. At a first glance, one can see its design as a harmonious consortium of careful contours and acute angles. And then at a second glance, its curvaceous arches, flashy pop-ups, voluptuous vents, and wide posterior already had you cheating on your comet. Grady spared no expense when it came to setting the standard for what a power trip on wheels should be, even taking on the US Department of Transport when it dared to mandate safety strikes be added to the cheetah's open side vents for concerns of pedestrian safety, or whatever that meant. Thankfully, Grady was able to help the court see through the injustice and have the department's case thrown out. After all, the presiding justices understood how silly their new cheetahs would have looked otherwise. Any small child or animal that found its way into the Grotti's fence shouldn't have been the way to begin with. Did I mention that the cheetah also came with an improved frunk space? You could even buy a six-piece leather luggage set which was designed to be resold at an 800% markup. Okay, let's talk shop. The cheetah takes corners exceptionally well for its age, most likely due to its low ride height and strategic rear mid-engine layout, weighing in at an admirable 3,300 pounds or so. When it comes to speed in a straight line, the cheetah smashes 60 before you can do a line of speed. Its top end isn't half bad either, putting the Torero to shame and nipping at the heels of its supercar cousin, the Turismo. This is because, for the most part, both cars have the same powerhouse. The engine could be best described as a flat 12, but if you majored in semantics, you could drone on about its shared crank journals and pistons lying on an x-axis. Nobody would care, but you'd look really smart doing it. Grotti wanted the Cheetah to have a distinct and refined driving experience, so even at 9,500 revs, the engine sounds relatively tame. This meant finding one that still had the factory exhaust and American spec cats was a big challenge. It also eats cam belts like candy. Now, if the Cheetah was expressly flamboyant on the outside, it's tastefully superficial inside. The essentials populate the gauge cluster, while the extras like blower, temperature, and oil sit in the low-slung center console. A gated shifter complements the ignition and climate controls between the seats, which control one measly vent in the center of the dashboard. These later models even got hand-stitching and grotty lettered across the dash to remind you just how much money you had. If this is what your commute looked like each day, life was good. If ever there was a car designed to pursue criminals and soak up the Leonida sunlight, it would be this car. In fact, the official uniform for owning one is a floral shirt, sunglasses, and a toothpick. However, in true grotty fashion, they couldn't leave well enough alone. More than 30 years had passed before the world was introduced to a brand new cheetah. This modern cheetah featured a design dreamt up in a 70s drug trip, and a V8 leftover from the Turismo line. These cars' massive identity crisis inevitably struck a chord with people who complain about exotic car ownership on internet forums. But, despite what the good people said on GrottyLovers.com, each and every car from the limited production run were scooped up in seconds. You can be sure that every oil tycoon and billionaire philanthropist who was invited to own one still has it sat in their living room. Simply put, this car wasn't really designed for mortals like you or I. Acquired taste or not, this car admirably escapes all conventional definition. It has the rolling side profile of an early 2000s supercar, the fighter jet canopy of a 1960s concept, and the carbon clad presence of a modern hypercar. It changes depending on the angle you look at. The engine simply doesn't do this car justice. It'll get you on a track quite smoothly, but you'll trail behind the rest of your supercar friends, even if they own an older Cheetah. We've covered the engine and styling, but I'll save us some time and skip the interior. You ain't missing much. Admittedly, I always had a soft spot for the Gen 2 Cheetah. If you're looking for a supercar with the mostest this or the bestest that, you'll have to keep looking. 
the second cheetah was special in its own right. If it had a name and engine to call its own, its unique character might have been better appreciated. Instead, it was set up from the beginning to be underpowered and misunderstood. Like a rock band incorporating new wave sound into their music, it's not bad, just different. In any case, I'm sure we're not going to have to wait long for Guardi to bring back the cheetah name when they need the money. <laughs>